Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Segway. Uh, despite the fact that Nepal is a small country about the size of Arkansas, located between India and China, it is a country that is very rich in history and culture. And in fact, many languages are spoken in that country. Today we're going to have an interview with a number of uh, Southern you know, University Edwardsville researchers who were in Nepal this past summer and who are doing some research in this particular area. They are Dr. Christine Hildebrand, who is an associate professor in the Department of English Language and Literature, Dr. Shun Fu Hu, who is professor in the Department of Geography, and Dr. Jessica Cream, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Welcome to Segway to all of you. Thank you. So let me start with a very simple question for you, Christine, which is, why Nepal? Indeed, why Nepal? My in initial interest in working in Nepal came strictly out of the um, program I was studying in for my PhD in linguistics. And uh, that program, which was at uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, had a strong emphasis in both field work and typology, which involves cross-language comparison, so linguistic analysis uh, by comparing patterns in a number of different languages. And it turns out Nepal is rich in both opportunities. There are over a hundred languages spoken in Nepal, distinct languages, countless uh, dialects and varieties of those languages. <clears throat> those languages belong to five distinct language families. And it's a really good area in which to do field work because people are wonderful to work with. They're very accommodating. And so I was lucky enough in my graduate program to uh, become involved with a research project that was just beginning there at the time that would bring us to Nepal for that kind of work. Dr. Shu, Shu Fuhu, you are a geographer by training, also uh, uh, ethnically uh, Chinese, and I was wondering why, what kind of contribution a geographer can make uh, to this type of studies of languages in Nepal? Yeah, when uh, Dr. Hedbrand uh, talked to me about uh, her idea to study the languages, uh, especially endangered languages in Nepal, uh, I was uh, you know, amazed to uh, link the, the speaking of the languages with the geographic uh, con context. Uh, my interest um, is first of all to see how those languages are uh, geographically distributed uh, and also how my you know, research expertise in online mapping to demonstrate these languages uh, to the general public. Did the fact that this Nepal is a border, bordering country with China, uh, you, do you find any similarities in terms of language and culture in Nepal versus what you find in continental China? Uh, yes. What, what kind of similarities do you find? Uh, the way that people interact with each other, um, and also you know, the food they eat, um, some of the cultures, uh, like religions, you know, their practice are uh, very similar to southeastern um, southwestern uh, China. Okay. Well, Dr. Cream, uh, Dr. you are in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what's the link between the educational part and this particular project? Well, uh, I was uh, brought on to the project uh, by Christine, um, and it wasn't originally uh, designed in the pro or the project for me to go to Nepal. Uh, however, uh, educate our schools and are, are basically kind of community centers, and uh, they're the the root of where you know the language centers are or at least the training for I, I, there's just a large group of, of people in in those areas so i looked at it from 
my point of view, I could study the educational system. So it's, it's a little bit of an add-on to her project, but it's something that connects really quite well. Okay. I wanted to ask Dr. Hillebrand, the Nepali is the official language of Nepal. By my understanding is almost half of the country do doesn't really speak Nepali. So how in such a small country, uh, with such diverse culture, how they uh, go about communicating themselves given this variety of languages? Yeah. So it's true, Nepali is the official, and it's um, technically speaking, the language of banking, language of official business and corporate business. And to the extent that you see um, active functioning schooling going on throughout the country, it's the language of education, although English is starting to become a more common presence in schools as well. Um, but despite that, once you leave the urban centers of Nepal, you lose Nepali as a commonly spoken language, although it still is a kind of a contact language because in a lot of parts of Nepal, people meet up, people from other places at least um, temporarily make contact with each other to trade or do business. Um, but in, once you leave the city, you really get into um, local languages, locally oriented languages. And uh, this is something that often surprises my undergraduate students when I say that um, our situation in the U.S. is one largely of um, societal monolingualism, where English is primarily the language of the U.S., despite um, native indigenous languages and also um, other uh, formerly colonial or um, migrant languages like Spanish. Engli we are largely monolingual, but that's not the case in most parts of the world. In fact, people in lots of other parts of the world are not only bilingual, but they're trilingual or they're polyglots, they quadrilingual and beyond. It's not a big deal. In fact, this is true even for people who've never had any formal education in their lives. They've never stepped foot into a classroom, and it's common to find them able to converse fluently and comfortably in four or five different languages. It does help that these languages are closely related to each other, so th while they're different, the, the differences are not that dramatic. So it's not like saying English and Chinese, which are quite different languages in comparison to each other, but it's just a way of life. It's a practical way of life. People will have a couple of uh, languages that are spoken in home environments with the family, with parents, um, and with close friends and peers. And then once they go out into the public world, depending on what their jobs or occupations are, they have command of other languages for those purposes. And that's something you actually see a lot of in, in Europe. Y yes. In fact, in fact, Europeans have this joke that people who speak several languages are Europeans, people who speak only one language are Americans. That's right, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, it, you know, for people who've never traveled outside of these um, kind of boundaries, the U.S. boundaries, uh, that's a surprising yeah. idea for them. Now, Dr. Hu, I wanted to ask you because we find a similar situation in China. Although Mandarin is the most spoken uh, Chinese language, that's not the only one by any means, and you have Cantonese, but there are also many uh, regional languages. How do you deal about with those issues in such a big country like China? You know, there, there are 52 minorities in, in China uh, itself, but uh, the main language, uh, everybody uses uh, is Mandarin. Uh, but uh, in, in practice, uh, people speak their own languages uh, at home. Now parents speak their own languages with their kids. You know. But uh, the, if the kids go to school, they speak Mandarin. Okay. I wanted to ask Dr. Cream, uh, from an educational viewpoint, uh, there have been some old theories around that they, they say, well, you shouldn't teach a, a kid more than one language early on because they can get kind of confused. But actually more modern research has shown that that's not the case, mm -hmm. that they can adapt to different languages very easily. Is, 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 is that correct? Yes. Uh, when I went into the schools, I had only learned, I think, maybe 50 to 75 Nepali words. And they came with their own regional dialects, but they learned Nepali in school and also some English as well. So I was able to communicate with them uh, a little bit, uh, I think enough to, to make myself understood. Um, but it, it was beneficial because they were able to, you know, converse with many other people. In that way, the teacher becomes the student in a yes. way. Yeah. Yeah. Which was a good teaching <laughs> experience. For Excellent. Sure. Dr. Hillebrand, I understand that uh, Manang is similar to Nepali 
in, in many ways. And I was wondering what makes Manang unique in terms of its nuances. I mean, we know in terms of pronunciation, French is, is particularly different from German, other sort of things. The grammar uh, is also different, but what makes Manang unique? Yeah. Well, the actual situation in, in Manang District, which is the area where we do our research, we can think of Manang District kind of like a county. One might think of Madison County, although Manang District has more mountains than Madison County, Illinois has. It's got more geographic relief to it. Uh, but um, and so Nepali is actually an Indo-European language and actually a distant cousin from English. So it's quite closely related to Hindi and it's part of the larger Indo-European family. The languages of Manang, of which there's actually a total of four or possibly possibly five, that's one of the questions we're trying to answer in this project, they're actually more closely related to Chinese, although they're very distant cousins to Chinese, but they're part of the Sino-Tibetan family. Uh, one of the interesting things that happens in, in countries like Nepal, though, is that it doesn't really matter in a way what family languages come from. The fact that they co-mingle for such long periods of time and are spoken in multilingual environments environments makes them start to resemble each other uh, in terms of vocabulary and in terms of their grammar over time. So Manange, which is the kind of uh, dominant lingua franca language of Manang district, is a Sino-Tibetan language, but it's taken on some interesting properties that look, make it look more like uh, Nepali through time. Uh, some of that has to do with particular lo loanwords, bar uh, vocabulary borrowings that have come in to uh, the Manange language. So for example, they use the word resham, which is a Nepali word for um, silk, as their word for silk as opposed to a Sino-Tibetan uh, originating word and so on and so forth. There's a lot of examples of that. And also in terms of certain things going on in the grammar, which start to look a little bit more like Nepali grammar. Um, other languages spoken in Manang, they're not in contact with Nepali as much, so they keep their conservative Sino-Tibetan vocabulary and grammatical properties. And this is one thing linguistically that I and uh, some of the linguist colleagues who are involved in this project and who are not here today are interested in discovering and uncovering about these languages, is to what extent we can say these Sino-Tibetan languages of Manang are starting to take on influences from Nepali and to what extent they hold on to their more conservative uh, properties. Dr. Hu, I wanted to ask you if, uh, did you find any similarities between Manang and Mandarin? I think, they think are, the numbers, uh, were, wasn't some of the counting going on, like Kri is one, and how is one, uh, what's one in Mandarin? Uh, yi. Yeah, so yeah. we find certain sound correspondences and very core vocabulary. Yeah, I didn't learn uh, Nepali mm. before I went to yeah. <laughs> Nepal, so. Yeah, we were his yeah. translators there, okay. so. Yeah. <laughs> but every now and then when we were chatting about uh, things casually, every now and then we'd stumble across a word that you found familiar yeah. to Mandarin. So for example, counting. And that's quite common in these languages, these Sino-Tibetan languages, like numbers one through 10 are quite similar to Mandarin. Very core concepts like person, house, Star, how about sky. Father and mother, father which are and mother. very common. Yeah. How, do yeah. you, how do you say father uh, and mother? Apa or ba for yeah. father, mm -hmm. and ama or ma for mother. Yeah, in Chinese, uh, papa, mama. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's and, and that's, that's I mean, <laughs> many languages, yeah. they have the, that similarity for father and mother. Yeah. It's right. very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're almost kind of universals with certain like mom and dad terms. Mm -hmm. They also happen to um, be some of the first consonants and vowels that babies produce. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, when we talk about uh, Manang, basically, Manange, we are talking about a uh, language that is spoken by very few people. And in those cases, obviously, you talk about a language that is transmitted from one generation to another. So I wanted to ask you as an educator, to what extent it is important to have that language to be taught in the schools so it doesn't get lost because at the end of the day, many parents or grandparents say, you better le learn a more useful language because this one won't take you anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, conversations going on. First of all, uh, in order for students to actually learn, they need to be taught in their home language. But in order for them to uh, be able to survive in the world outside of their home language, they need to know Nepali and even English. And as 
I, I think as an educator, I think it's important to learn all of them so that you can function in different societies. Uh, but Christy might have some more input on that as far as studying the language. I think one of the things you and I were thinking a lot about was, okay, should, should language learning be replacive, and that is Nepali replaces local languages, or should it be an additive um, um, approach in which Nepali is added to the repertoire of local languages? So that is one question. Another question we were thinking about is, to what extent can these languages be taught in school if they don't have writing systems? So these languages essentially don't have a written tradition, they're entirely oral languages. That's a big, big question to answer. We don't have even enough time today to answer that question. A third question that you were primarily dealing with is to what extent is the local school system equipped in terms of where the teachers get their training and how they interact in the local school system to handle a, a task of bringing in local languages? Is the local school system a functioning system to begin with? And we found some issues and gaps with respect to how local schools even function on a day-to-day -day level uh, before you even try to introduce a new, a new level of um, pedagogy and curriculum in language teaching. So, so you know, you, you were there primarily to kind of observe how and to what extent local schools function yes. uh, at and a baseline. Yes, <laughs> and uh, when I was there, uh, the big push right now is to teach students in English, but many uh, speakers of, you know, maybe Manang, uh, Manangay, um, they speak Nepali, but they don't speak English very well, or enough, and uh, they don't know it well enough to teach in it. So when I showed up, I think that it was very exciting because I'm a native English speaker, and they threw me right into the classroom, uh, and I taught three classes on my first day. So I think that you know they're definitely um, smart to utilize that, but I was very shocked to have to teach class. I thought I was going to observe and. But it was exciting. Now, Nepal has gone through some political changes in the last few decades, and so has China. And I was wondering if sometimes the issue of local languages become a contentious issue from a political viewpoint, because sometimes more authoritarian regimes trying to impose a particular type of culture. Did you observe something like that in Nepal? Not from what I observed. The, yeah, these t the, if, you're, if you're in the urban area, there's definitely a national language movement going on. You see it showing up in editorial op-ed pieces in the local newspapers in Kathmandu, saying one nation, uh, uh, one united nation, one united language. And you see a lot of debates going on in the paper. But those debates typically don't reach the more remote parts of the country. First of all, the newspapers don't reach the more remote parts of the country. And the internet still has not really reached more remote parts of the country, although you do occasionally find certain places where you can do a kind of dial-up internet access. But because of that, those discourses don't really happen there. Um, one of the biggest issues with the political upheaval that happened over a period of Nepal wasn't uh, so much a, a kind of um, language, um, uh, language policy changes, but it was um, because of the civil war and civil strife that was going on in Nepal, people left their villages. So there was a depletion of human presence in these villages, which can also have its own kind of devastating effect on languages and language practice. But yeah, once you're in the urban areas, the national language issue crops back up again, but you don't see it in Manang so much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cream, this is uh, uh, the project you all were working together. It's a project funded by the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. And most people identify the National Science Foundation with mm -hmm. the hard sciences. <laughs> and suddenly we have people here who are not particularly in that area, sounds more, although linguists will, will say, well, we're not really humanities, we're really more uh, social sciences type. Um, why do you think that an institution like the National Science Foundation will fund a project like this that is long-term and takes money to, to accomplish? I think I'm gonna have to turn that over to no. Christine. <laughs> no. <laughs> because she's the, the PI of the grant and well, I think that, um, I mean, this is an agenda that uh, President Obama has going on as well, is uh, what is it that we know and don't know about the human mind, about the human brain? So there's a large mapping the brain initiative coming out of the White House. My project is not um, the result of th this um, uh, push uh, from, from the Obama administration, but it does tap into that very central question, to what extent uh, t does our knowledge about language, language preservation, and multilingual societies 
tell us about what it means to be human, in particular what it, how the human mind works. How uh, can we use uh, bilingual experiences, multilingual experiences, practices, attitudes, and also um, how we study the, the grammatical structures of these languages to learn more about uh, the human condition. So I think that's uh, inherently an NSF-friendly uh, um, project. Yeah, project <laughs> uh, and approach. Okay. Dr. Hu, what, was, what is your major role in this particular project? Yeah, my role in this project uh, is to develop uh, an online electronic atlas that uh, to allow the general public to access the data we collected. Um, the data means in, in terms of uh, the language uh, themselves and also you know, the distribution of the languages. So you use what is called geographic information system to map this in terms of, and do you find a lot of overlaps of several languages as being spoken in the same area? Yeah, they're, they're all scattered, but uh, there are concentrations in certain villages. Okay. Do you plan also to take a historical look of this, uh, that is, how things were before and how things are changing uh, as history happens? Then I need to get a lot of data from <laughs> Dr. Hedberg, and yeah. probably. <laughs> our, our knowledge of, of the history of these languages is a very shallow knowledge in terms of the past. In terms of the future, let's see what kind of... Um, you know, momentum we can keep going from this project. Um, but sometimes um, a good snapshot of, snapshot of the present can tell us quite a bit about the past and perhaps something about the future as well. One of the requirements of these types of projects now in NSF is an element of portability and public access. So this kind of wider, uh, wider, broader impacts of what we're doing. And so we thought that this atlas would be a great way for anybody to have access to the types of things that were, types of questions we're asking and the types of data that we're collecting. And particularly the way that, um, that Doctor Who designs everything, it's really kind of user friendly and a beautiful interface. And um, uh, it's, it, it all kind of comes back to this notion of visualization in research. How can one visualize the kind of research that we're doing? Because visualization aspects of projects then